So this is gonna be a really, real brief history of data collection. So I Googled it this morning. What's the oldest unit of measurement we could find? And according to Google, not Bing, it was the Egyptian's cubit. Anybody know what that was? It was measuring from your elbow to the tip of your finger, and then your thumb was about an inch. So that was one of the earliest forms of collection that we have. If we jump ahead to about the 1780s, you had this thing called the chain and compass. So people would go from east coast to west coast of the, of the nation, pulling a, a metal uh, chain 66 feet at a time, and they're dropping points every half mile and mile. If you go up to an airplane, look down, everything's in a nice square. That's what they were doing. Uh, that was the basis of coordinate systems, what we use for today. That established the township and range lines every half mile, mile. You don't see it every day, but we do use it every day. In about the 1940s, there was this thing called a theodolite. So that you could take an angle and turn it from a known position and use a chain going ahead to figure out where you were on your, where you were basically in the, in the world. 1970s or 1980s came the EDM, that's what's showing up there. And this is where it really starts to all kind of connect. The EDM would take a laser pulse and shoot it and measure it back distance. So that's how a lot of these new, or this is how everything's based on is energy coming back and forth. Uh, and that's how you get your measurement as opposed to pulling a chain 66 feet across and measuring it an angle that way. So you might be asking, cool, now what? So as we've seen since, I don't know, the beginning of time, we've always measured stuff. We're doing the same thing now, just a little bit different. Uh, it's advancing technology. It's a toolbox. There's all sorts of different applications for all sorts of different tools. We'll hear, you guys probably heard about GPS. We probably use that every day. You could probably use GPS on your phone to tell you where you are right now. We still use it with this stuff. Um, LiDAR, and it is light detection and ranging, is that right? Yeah, there I got it. I'm doing good. You'll hear them talk about beam divergence too. Now this is kind of cool. If you look at the slide up there, in a nutshell, if you would take uh, a flashlight and beam it to the back of the round, back of the room, it's gonna get wider. But the intensity of these scanners focus down on a focal point that's much, much less. That's beam divergence. And uh, we'll talk about returns too. So just imagine you're up in the airplane, you're up on a drone, not up on a drone, in a drone, using a drone on the SX-10 scanner. It's gonna shoot something out, it's gonna come back and you're gonna see what it hits. In the airplane, you might pick up trees, uh, birds, everything else. So shooting multiple beams of energy up and down and measure itself. So with that, that was the briefest history of measurements you'll ever hear. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Nathan Cooper with Tribble Precision. All right, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so this afternoon, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Trimble SX-10 uh, scanning total station and some of the examples uh, and some of the benefits uh, that the DOT and, and surveyors use uh, uh, out in the field uh, with this new technology. Um, so some of the applications and stuff that we're talking about uh, um, is topographic surveying, um, utility surveying, um, roads, uh, infrastructure, bridges, um, earthworks, so going out and doing volumes uh, uh, on stockpiles, um, even doing measurements of culverts uh, and utility crossings, uh, ADA surveys. Um, so this new technology can, can really make things move a lot quicker and, uh, and get good information and keep the surveyor safe. Um, so I've got uh, uh, four examples today, and in each example, we're going to talk about the equipment used, the time uh, that we're going to save in the field, and kind of some of the, the methods uh, for each uh, example. Um, so with the first example, um, uh, doing a topographic survey, like uh, going outside and, uh, 
and collecting data for three or four city blocks or more, um, we're gonna use the SX10 scanning total station and uh, the GPS receiver, uh, not the one in your phone, um, and then a data collector. Um, in this example, we're gonna take two SX10s uh, and GPS receivers, and we're gonna collect this, uh, these city blocks in, in, in less than five hours. Um, and we're gonna scan and capture everything that we see. And we're gonna use what they call horizontal band scan. And what that means is if, uh, if I select it above that silver spot up there, um, the data collector is gonna take and put a circle all the way around. And it's gonna scan and take pictures of everything um, in that 360 degree view, like you see in the picture. So uh, the benefit of that uh, using the GPS and the SX10 total station is that I can move and scan and move and scan and I can collect this whole city in a small amount of time. And, uh, and while it's doing scanning, I can use my GPS receiver and I can collect back a curb or, or center line uh, uh, as we go. And then as it's being uh, collected, it's automatically putting it together. So I get, I see exactly what I'm scanning and it's putting it together. So when I get back into the office, um, I can start creating my deliverables, uh, uh, which is really nice. So quicker out in the field and then creating deliverables back in the office. Um, and that eliminates uh, not having to go back to a site. Uh, which is nice because a lot of times the surveyors, uh, they go a hundred miles or, or longer away from their site. And uh, if they use the scanner and the photos, they can collect that and then they can create information uh, back in the office. Um, the second example um, is a power line utility survey. Um, we're gonna use the SX-10 again. Um, it's gonna take a, a one man crew uh, three hours and we can set up and uh, uh, six times and we can get a one mile uh, power line uh, with the SX-10 using the polygonal framing. And what that means is that I can just select what I wanna scan um, and, and collect that only. So if I'm doing this stand here, I could go up and around and it's only gonna scan and take pictures of what I select. Um, so you'll see there uh, the mile long survey, uh, using the polygonal framing tool, I can just go in polygon around the power line and it's only gonna collect the information that I choose. So um, I can scan and I can move and scan and move um, using the SX-10 and it's got a range of 600 meters, which is really awesome. Um, and then it has high vis cameras uh, built in called vision technology. And this is really important uh, to capture um, very important things along the, the, the power line. So if we look uh, here, we can zoom in even at 600 feet and see how close we can get into the conductor. Um, so we can document things not only with the 3D scan data, but also with the photos, uh, which makes it nice. Here's a big one uh, for the DOT uh, um, going out and collecting infrastructure roadway or in this example, uh, creating a, or, or surveying a bridge. Um, again, using the SX-10 scanning total station and the GPS receiver with the data collector. Um, it's only gonna take four hours with a one man crew and they can hop around and resection and they can collect the data on the bridge um, using the polygonal framing tool. Um, and then we can take the GPS receiver and we can collect data. Um, all of this being done without the surveyor having to go out into the middle of the road like they've had to in the past. Um, so some of the benefits uh, um, is to scan and capture the GPS observations at the same time. So we can start the scanner and now I can go and I can collect the, the edge of the, the pavement or anything else. Uh, um, while it's doing its scanning. Um, and then now you'll see another nice picture uh, of the, using the vision technology is I can zoom in um, from a long distance away and take pictures. Now, when I get back into the office, I can actually create survey quality points on the bridge bolts. 
or anything else that would be uh, uh, needed uh, without having to send a surveyor out there or use a tape measure, like getting your, uh, your heights of your bridges. I can scan it and come back into the office. Now I could go four lines across and I could see a height on, on each side and uh, I'm not sending somebody out there and, and uh, uh, putting them in harm's way. Um, my last example um, is the stockpile or a borrow pit um, using the SX-10 and a GPS receiver. Um, we can actually take a big stockpile and we can set up uh, four times and we can collect the stockpile and, uh, and then we're able to uh, go in and get volumetrics. So either out in the field I can do a quick volume and I'll know exactly what's in that stockpile, or I can even bring it into Trimble Business Center and, uh, and do volume so I could do surface to surface comparisons and things like that, uh, uh, which makes it really nice and quick. And again, we're able to scan this and, and do everything without putting the surveyor uh, up on the pile um, and keeping them safe. Some of the benefits you can, it's quick and easy. Um, you can do your surface to surface comparison uh, as the pile grows or shrinks. Um, you utilize GPS along with your SX10 uh, to collect data around the, the, the bottom of the stockpile. And, uh, and then we can do cut and fill design reports and, and earthwork project uh, uh, pretty easily. So in summary, um, use the, the SX-10 total station. It allows us to, to do everything uh, uh, with one instrument. So we can scan, um, we can stake out points, um, we can take panorama photos, um, we can combine, we can do what we call integrated surveying um, with the GPS and the, and the total station at the same time. And then all that data is, is, is put together nice and neat. And we can bring that into Trimble Business Center or into TopoDot or MicroStation and, and create our deliverables, uh, um, which, is, which is excellent. Um, and then again, just documenting sites um, with photos or panoramas. Uh, so a lot of times when a surveyor goes out and they collect the data, um, and they bring the data back into the office. Uh, a lot of times the engineer hasn't uh, been out to the site or he doesn't know that it changed and things like that. So you can use those photos uh, and panoramas to, to show uh, the guys back in the office what it looks like. Um, as a surveyor, you don't have to have a lot of training because it's using the same workflow that they're used to uh, day to day. Um, and then it the, just allows you to uh, use one instrument. You can do a lot of different things. So you don't have to have uh, three different tools in the toolbox. You've got one tool in the toolbox that will do all three. So um, that's a little bit about uh, the SX-10 scanning total station. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Brett and he's gonna talk about uh, the UAS uh, TrueView 640. So thank you. Thank you, Nathan. As you heard, my name is Brett and I've been overseeing the product development with the UAS LiDAR system. I'm here to show you what we have found on the four projects that we used it on. As shown above me is the Prism Coaxial X8 my, made by Watts Innovation that the DOT, DOT purchased for LiDAR use. It has a flight times between 12 and 40 minutes dependent on weather and payloads and can reach up speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. It's an American made drone that provides a strong and steady platform for LiDAR point cloud collection. I do have the Prism on display in exhibit hall B at booth 47 if anybody wants to check it out later. <clears throat> Underneath it, the payload is the scanner. The system that the DOT chose was the TrueView 640. It was put together by a company called GeoQ out of Alabama. They specialize in 
LIDAR collection and imagery collection for drone use. On the front of the unit is a computer board, which is a Google driven processing unit that controls the whole system. Next in line are the dual Sony megapixel or 20 megapixel RGB cameras. They are set at a 25 degree oblique manner to provide 120 degree field of view to be able to capture the size of objects. Now you might ask, why does LiDAR need camera? The camera pro provides a picture that has pixels within it. Each pixel has an RGB value. This value is then translated to the point that's associated with it by GPS seconds of the week. That value is then into that point, thus creating a colorized point cloud. The scanner they did use for the system is a Regal Mini Bucks 3 UAV. And the whole system together weighs about eight pounds and is all self-powered on its own battery, making it a, a very small but powerful package. This package together is what is providing us with two centimeters of accuracy and why we are here to showcase it. This unit could provide us with capabilities to expand our survey abilities, but most importantly, to provide safety to the surveyors to get them off the road. And Nathan touched a lot about that. Safety is primary goal for this kind of technology. Next up is of course the software package that drives it all. We chose TrueView Evo. It's a very, very powerful package and can produce many deliverables. Um, what we've been using it for is mosaic creation, trajectory files, and can even classify point clouds. All right, this is the good stuff. You get to actually see the, the projects we, we worked it on, if I can get this out of here. There we go. All right, this is uh, the first project we used it on. It's up by Brooks Junction. That's Highway 52 and Highway 2. Uh, the, <laughs> Everybody knows the weather in the state of North Dakota, and we were challenged with both weather patterns in the last two months of the year. This one particularly was 110 degrees that day, and the forest fires had moved in a lot of smoke into the area. We were concerned that we would be picking up a lot of noise with that smoke in the area, but we were actually pretty pleased that no additional noise was really really noticed. As you can see by the red line on the south side of the highway, I was able to create two flight paths on top of each other. And this created a double point density on top of the south bound lane. This is one very big benefit with the prism is that it allows us to fly low and slow. And that's huge for point density. This is a site just to kind of the southeast of Brooks Junction. On this particular section, we were challenged with line of sight as it's very hilly in this area. We use software that kind of gave us an idea of where we could position ourselves to still visually maintain sight of the drone and complete the project safely. This one was a little challenging. As you can see, the flight path was about a half mile long. So we, we actually had additional help on the project and we positioned them at the beginning and the end with Bluetooth headsets so that we could cross the highway when there was no traffic below. Ah, the pretty picture. All right, so uh, Nathan touched on returns. One of the benefits of the Regal Mini Bucks is it has the capabilities of five returns. Here's a description of what returns are. We set our point cloud and software up to depict those. Some companies call those echoes. Uh, we'll just stick with the easy word return. Here you can see three colors. Uh, the pink would probably be your first return. So it's using a certain percentage of the laser power to send back to the aircraft, while the rest of the percentage of the uh, laser pulse continues on. 
This is hugely beneficial to be able to penetrate through tree masses. But as you can see, the coniferous trees are still posing somewhat of a problem. We can't quite penetrate those, but our software does have the ability to stitch underneath that and still provide us a surface, which is what we're going for. Uh, everything with LIDAR for the DOT is getting the surface creation. All right, here is uh, another project, of course, in North Dakota near air. Uh, this, we wanted to see what kind of penetration we had in the standing cornfield. I had planned four flights to be able to kind of set it up so we penetrate in between the corn rows, no matter what direction the corn was running. And we were very pleased that it did penetrate through the corn easily. Uh, we were challenged with weather again on this project because the uh, system moved in and it got real misty and overclass, overcast, but we were still able to collect the data we needed with just the two flights. And those two flights were the east and west flights. Here's just some good pictures of the point cloud after the project. Uh, the profile field, you can clearly see the rows of the corn. Uh, if I did some more point cloud classifications, you would be able to classify the heights of the different kinds of corns and the elevations. You can see that depicted in the 3D view. Yellow would be a different elevation range. And even with one flight over these power lines, I was still able to capture it and use it for clearance data. Uh, this also shows in the plan view that with just two flights, I was able to cover the whole quarter section of land. This is a project up by Williston. Uh, we were actually asked by the survey crew to provide data on this, this project because this intersection is very busy. I used the drone to not do a box pattern around the intersection like I typically would because of traffic. So I just kept it on either sides of the highway but it provided a lot more density on the road surface. I think after this flight with all of it, you were probably looking at 200 plus point density on the actual road surface. This is the intersection of 1804 and Highway 2, just west of the intersection I was showing you. I got kind of creative here accidentally and sped up the drone to see what kind of point cl cloud I could get at high speeds. As you can see, 9.8 meters per second, roughly 22 miles an hour. But since this intersection was a lot less busy, I did a square box pattern around it and just used the pause option to be able to cross over the highway when there's no traffic below. As you can see, you you do see some traffic, but our, our drone is actually flying to the side of it. But even at 22 meter, uh, miles per hour, I was able to capture the traffic control signals. So, so it's really project-based. What, what are you gonna need for point density? What do you need to capture? This one, we just needed a road surface. So I went, I went fast. If I was gonna collect curb and gubber, I'd go really slow and I try to make the drone crab so that my laser beam is shooting at different angles. All right, this is the last project we used it on up in Twin Buttes. Um, main bone benefits from aerial re, uh, recovery is you can stay within your right of way and never leave your right of way. This is hugely beneficial for being invasive, not only on public lands, but possibly historically significant lands. Any way we can get coverage of areas that we don't have to put a foot on is very beneficial. Like I said, challenged with weather. This project, we were challenged with the other weather. It was only 14 degrees. 
and we had just gotten a little light dusting of snow. I was actually very impressed that it was able to collect through the snow. Here are just some pictures of the point cloud from that project. This was highly beneficial because it provided a live view of the project and the designer discovered that there was apartment complex that had been built. As you can see, there are many uses for the just the DOT, but I feel there are much, much greater uses throughout the state of North Dakota besides just road surfaces. Most importantly, the safety to our survey crew. With that, I'll hand it over to Troy. He's going to explain more about how lasers actually work and the terrain mapper too. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Make it a second or without breaking it. That's close enough. Okay, what I wanted to show you guys today was the Leica Terrain Mapper 2, Terrain Mapper 2. We got it in June, installed in our aircraft, um, and we've been using it ever since. Um, the Terrain Mapper is installed in our uh, caravan aircraft. It has a camera well cut in the bottom, plus it has Bombay doors, which allows for a cover to be closed while we're in flight or landing. It's uh, very, very, functional aircraft, we can fly slow with it so we can get very steady results from our sensors. And there we go. And over the years, oh, sorry. Over the years, you guys may have uh, heard us talk about our DMC camera we had. We've had it since 2007. It's been very reliable for us. It uh, was a bit complicated, had a lot of peripherals, like you can see with a bunch of wires. Uh, the terrain mappers, much more integrated. All the components are inside the system itself. So we have much less to uh, deal with when we're in the aircraft. It's a much cleaner install. With that, Terrain Mapper 2 has two 100 megapixel, megapixel cameras, which is 50% more resolution than we got with the DMC. It also has a very capable Hyperion 2 LiDAR unit in it that uh, we're talking about LiDAR. So, um, the console for the pilot and the operator are very useful. The pilot can see everything that's going on with our image capture or and LiDAR capture. And the gyro stabilized mount, which I'll come up a little bit later and explain a little bit more about. And here's a, a bunch of statistics for anyone out there that might be a LiDAR geek. I'll let you go ahead and read through them. Two things I wanted to point out was with this system, we can get up to 64 million measurements per second while we're flying. And it also is a class four laser, which is extremely powerful. It allows us to get through the vegetation very, very well. If you think of Chris's explanation of the flashlight, if you can sign a flashlight at a bush and you can get the light all the way through to the ground, it's the same with LIDAR. The more powerful the light, the more likely you are to actually see the ground. Uh, with this, we have several software packages. Uh, Mission Pro, we've been using for, for years now, uh, but we only used it to plan missions that dealt with imagery. Now that we're dealing with LiDAR, it's a completely different thing. We have to worry about so many more functions of the system, uh, pulse rate, scan rate, signal to noise ratio, uh, the power of the actual laser and field of view. Uh, basically, we do all of our planning now specifically for the LiDAR. The imagery is, is just an afterthought at this point. And one thing that's kind of unique as well with the planning of missions is our pilots had to now a whole new item that they have to be concerned with when they're flying. Before, when we were flying, we flew a project over Grand Forks with the DMC, and we needed to make sure they were right over the roadway so we could see the building faces. So we gave them a leeway of only plus or minus 20 feet when they were flying, which is ridiculous for flying an aircraft that high. Um, and altitude, that's very important for us too. We like them to stay within about 100 feet of altitude. You can imagine the updrafts, up drafts, down drafts. We have headwinds, 50 knots. Um, 
now they have to actually maintain a specific speed with the LIDAR as well. We only give them plus or minus five knots to work with. And to me, I don't know, that, that's kind of like threading a needle on a roller coaster going 100 knots an hour. It's, it seems ridiculous, but they can do it. So more power to them. Uh, Flight Pro, this is the software in the aircraft. The pilots can see it. The operator, Monty over Gaywich, can also operate it and manipulate the controls and monitor what's going on during the mission. Uh, Nurse Explorer, uh, when we fly our controlled projects, Chris and his group goes and sets a GPS base station up on the site that we're going to fly over. He collects data for um, 10 minutes before we get there to at least 10 minutes after we get there. We get that information back, put it in Inertial Explorer, process it. We get a highly refined trajectory that we can then push on to the next software, which would be HexMap. This is their um, flagship application, has many modules. Uh, its primary goal is to uh, merge the trajectory information with the LIDAR and the imagery to create the refined point cloud that we can get out the colorized point cloud, like Brett said, and uh, also imagery that we can pass on to additional software in the system. And this is our vulnerable uh, image station software. We've had it around since 2004. It helps us with uh, doing analytics on the imagery, doing stereo compilation, and making mosaics. The terrain mapper is, uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember a quote that I got from Monty. I think it can make it over 80% of the state within an hour when we take off here in Bismarck. So basically we can get anywhere in the state in an hour, uh, capture a 15 mile project in about 40 minutes with eight or nine flight lines, and then get back to Bismarck and have the data in the can. It's, it's very efficient over large areas. So that, that's its primary um, efficiency. And I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit here. Um, we're gonna now compare the three systems that you've seen so you can see the differences between the data that's collected and what we can do with it. The SX-10, uh, you can kind of see it's doing a little scan pattern there. I tried to mimic it the best I could in PowerPoint. Eh, hopefully it worked. Um, but basically it scans up and down and then kind of goes in a circle around. The, it's very, very dense data depending on how far away from the scanner it's going. The, um, the wonderful thing about this, like they said, it can get under bridges. It, it's, uh, it's just immensely powerful at short range, but you can see the point density there, over 5,000 points in that bottom square in the image. Uh, that might be a little more than we need. Yeah. Okay, and onto the TrueView system. TrueView system, it uh, has a linear scanner. Uh, you can kind of see the, the scan pattern on there. You can also see in the image. Uh, sorry, I couldn't get them going the same direction. It's just the limit of the PowerPoint. Um, not, not quite as much as the SX-10, but it's still a, an excessive amount of points to uh, allow us and assist us to do our surveys with. Um, you can see the different densities in the, the image, and that's because as the drone is flying along, it is impacted by wind, and the TrueView system is attached directly to the, the UAV. So as it gets pushed forward, slows down, gets pushed forward, it'll collect different densities. But uh, the operator, Brett, will uh, accommodate for this by planning how fast he's gonna fly the mission. And he, he managed to nail the point density even in the, the really low range of 71 points per, per square meter. I don't think I did that. Look. <laughs> and this is the train mapper. It has a circular scanner or conical scanner. Um, it gets, it's mounted in that gyro stabilized platform that I told you about. So as the aircraft is flying along and it's, it's pitching and yawing and moving, the gyro stabilized mount keeps it pointed perfectly nadir the entire time. This allows for a very, very consistent point pattern. Um, you can see the, the lattice pattern that is formed by the, the terrain mapper itself. Um, the one thing I don't know if you paid attention to with the SX-10, you can actually see the paint stripes on this road portion really well. On the terrain mapper, it's a lot harder to discern. Uh, I bypassed all my slides. Okay. Um, every, every system has the capability to uniquely collect something we need for our preliminary survey data. The um, the SX-10 
is, is great for those areas that we can't see with any of our aerial platforms. And Nathan touched on some of that with uh, the bridge work. Um, it, it's kind of hard to get our drone to fly upside down. Maybe Brett will learn how to do that someday. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and the terrain mapper excels at the large projects, as I mentioned, and the TrueView system can be deployed on uh, small projects extremely efficiently. Um, now to the point of what, why you do this, we want to get to the point clouds, the point clouds within it, we can get the, um, coordinates, we can get intensity, we can get RGB, we can get a lot of stuff we need to get the surface created. And we take the points, we put it into terror scan to clean up the data. Uh, we use all this information to classify all the different points so we can get it to the ground, to the bare earth model. And once we get those ground points, we can take the information we can bring it into TopoDot, which is where the rubber hits the road. We take all these point cloud data, we extract the information from it to make line work in order to make a tin, in order to get the information to designers so they can do the work and continue on with their project. Um, it's, it's, it's a very efficient software. It increased our uh, product generation by about 75%. It's, uh, it's amazing how, how much it did help us. And, these systems and software combined give us the ability to create surveys more efficiently and more accurate than ever before. And that's four times I hit it. Um, and I just wanted to leave a note. Um, please visit Brett and Nathan's booth. They're both against the back wall, opposite sides, but you can go back there and see them. And with that, I wanna thank you everyone for attending our presentation.